The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. Can the lessons of this great work be applied to Crusader Kings 3? To answer that question, I spent the past week studying this renowned political treatise, which serves as a guide for those new and aspiring princes and rulers. From this endeavour, I have extracted some key principles, which I will look to implement throughout the course of this playthrough. For example, Machiavelli shuns the use of mercenaries, instead advising that we build a powerful private army, therefore we won't be using any mercenaries throughout the course of the game. He suggests also that when confronted with the dichotomy of being loved or feared, he states that it is better to be feared than it is to be loved. And although not directly attributable to Machiavelli, above all else, the end justifies the means. To honour this distinguished writer and diplomat, we will be playing in Firenze in Italy as the Duke of Tuscany. Using a character build that carefully melds together diplomacy and intrigue, the fitting of a man of Niccolo's constitution. Taking the traits gregarious, deceitful, and of course, cynical, as well as the congenital trait intelligent. So let us begin our quest for unyielding power as we dive into the crucible of medieval Italy. Let us first assess the diplomatic situation, referring to a quote from chapter 3 of The Prince. The prince sought to make himself the head and defender of his less powerful neighbours and to weaken the more powerful amongst them, taking care not to let a foreign power gain a foothold in the region. In our case, this means avoiding working with the Duke of Spoleto and the papacy, who are already great powers in the north of Italy. Instead, we shall look to the Duke of Friuli, a lesser power, but formidable nonetheless. To secure a lasting alliance, we will initially go down the diplomacy tree, taking the park defensive negotiations, which gives us a free alliance without the need for a marriage. We will also be taking family focus in order to get more children, which gives us more opportunity for further alliances, as well as other opportunities to rise in power. Speaking of family, it is time to select an appropriate wife, Machiavelli valued highly educated family members, and thus we will be selecting a genius wife. It is also important to make sure that we understand the laws, customs and languages of the nearby provinces. We will begin to apply ourselves to learning the Frankish language once we've managed to sway the Duke of Friuli. To weaken Spoleto, we seek to remove the current ruler, expecting that a weaker sovereign will take up his place. Our attempt to poison him succeeds. Our wife gives birth to a genius daughter, Lucretia. We learn the French language, and we manage to fabricate a claim on all of Spoleto. However, we have been cautioned against relying on good fortune, because according to Machiavelli, fortune is a woman. Seeing that the new 13-year-old duke has managed to secure an alliance, it is time to take him out too leading the child into the forest where he is devoured by some unknown beast. Beginning with our daughter, we imbue our dynasty with wisdom, also taking groom to rule to give them extra skill points. By this point, we've managed to sway the Duke of Friuli to our cause, gaining an alliance, and then we quickly launch an assault on Spoleto, for in times of peace, we have been preparing for war. We continue to go down the diplomacy tree before quickly switching into intrigue, taking the temptation focus in order to keep our fertility high, and then through a cunning, seducing our wife in order to ensure a vast number of offspring. Our campaign in Spoleto coming quickly to an end as we and our allies siege down the capital, securing land of the same laws, language and customs, which Machiavelli suggests will be very easy to hold. To make sure we're not over the domain limit, we give out some excess lands in Corsica to an Italian of our choosing boosting his opinion of us and bringing him under our wing. Looking to expand our sphere of influence, we take truth as relative, giving us the ability to fabricate hooks. We begin to scheme against the king of Italy, our liege. We ensure to sway our bishop and make sure we are in good stead with the church, as we are advised to ensure that we maintain an appearance of religiosity, but be ready to act impiously should the need arise. Our wife gives birth to twins, two precocious boys, Cesare and Francesco. Unfortunately, the winds of fortune are not within our favour today, and before being able to fabricate a hook, the king dies, leaving the kingdom to a small child, although he does appoint us as his steward. We ruminate on what nefarious schemes to plan next, and while we do this, we discover that our daughter is not one of ours, but no matter. We shall let our wife continue with her indiscretions, so long as she is producing useful tools to meet our ends. We attempt to fabricate hooks on Western Europe's powerful leaders, 
making use of our deceitful trait, which gives us a 20% bonus to success chance if we have level 1 stress and take the art of scheming decision. We then continue down the schemer tree, taking the perks that give us a percentage bonus to murder chance, as well as any hostile scheme success chance, before moving into authority focus, where we look to increase our dread and control over our domains. With a hook finally fabricated against the king of West Francia, after exposing his vices, we plan on using said hook to secure a marriage with our daughter and his son. However, he no longer has control over his son because he's landed, so instead we look to marry one of our sons to his daughter. However, the problem is, his daughter is already married, so we see to it that she becomes single over the course of the next few months. Before we're able to sway the king any further and secure a marriage, Lady Fortune's disposition towards us changes for the worse, with the king of Francia unfortunately passing away. So instead, we turn our focus back to the Italian front. To ensure that we remain top dog in the region, we take our allies to war against Genoa, completely crushing them and taking control of the province. We take Bella Justum to save on prestige costs and make sure to hoard up our gold balances, as Machiavelli advises on being miserly rather than generous. When given the option between generosity and dread, we obviously go for the one for Dread, and then bolster that further with Serve the Crown, bringing our Dread up to 25. We manage our stress through hunts, which Machiavelli actually advises because they allow the ruler to get a better understanding of the land for times of war. With our foreign schemes falling through, we turn inward, instead looking to bolster our position within the realm, looking to outfox our own liege, staging a false attack where we play the hero, forever putting him in our debt. We marry off our eldest daughter to him, the cunning Lucretia, forming a powerful alliance and cementing our position in the United Kingdoms of Burgundy and Italy. In this time, Cesare's education is going swimmingly, with him also becoming cynical. We take the forced vassalization perk, providing the opportunity to wage wars overseas and to hopefully establish Italian colonies, which Machiavelli asserts is a cheaper way of maintaining control over the region. With our daughter Lucretia and our liege producing a child, we use our influence to make sure that our son Cesare is married to our new granddaughter. Cesare himself, now being cynical, deceitful and arbitrary, a great set of traits to carry forward the future of our dynasty. We now just need to make sure our granddaughter remains sole heir to the throne. We expand the realm by attacking weak foreign powers to the south, and we need to ensure our remaining two daughters are married off, as one of them started to get randy with one of the bishops. I'm now going for scholarship focus in order to boost up the development in Florence, and begin to invest in the economic infrastructure there to create a prosperous city and win the will of the people. Our prudence also meaning we have enough gold balances to develop many of the cities around Tuscany. By this point our daughter has given birth to a couple of sons, putting the girl betrothed to Cesare third in line for the throne. We will have to see to that, and begin scheming immediately. Throwing little Louis into the forest, where a great tragedy befalls him. We find suitors for our two licentious daughters, and we turn to secure power in the domain of East Francia, fabricating a hook on that king, getting a matrilineal marriage with one of his heirs, meaning our dynasty stands a chance to inherit the throne, giving us a useful and powerful ally. We continue to take important steps to make sure that it is our great-granddaughter and Cesare who are inheriting the throne of Burgundy. We conduct another swift and easy war, taking the Duchy of Calabria and seeing to it that another of the heirs to Burgundy takes a little bit of a tumble. We've gone down the whole of the body tree to stay alive as long as possible and make sure that our master plans are complete. Our newly conquered lands in the south of Italy we give to one of our sons, who shall be a loyal ally. We continue to develop the economy in Tuscany, our miserly ways now ensuring we're at 10 gold per month. Facing a blackmail attempt, we decide to call their bluff, revealing our true nature, inspiring fear into the hearts of our vassals and enemies, no one daring to cross us again, for they know what fate shall befall them. Our level of dread now reaching 47, we form a further powerful alliance with the King of Bavaria, and then crush the Duke of Benevento, who is no match for us and our allies. But our thirst for power has not been quenched, and we look for grander ambitions, turning east to the Byzantine Empire. 
wishing to secure it for our dynasty. Step 1. We marry Cesare II, our great-grandson, to one of the daughters of the Byzantine Empire. Step 2. Check the line of succession. And finally, step 3. Murder every man, woman and child who stands to inherit ahead of our grandson's future wife. Dozens of bodies piling up due to our intrigue skill, the perks from the intrigue tree and the bonuses from the Gale dynasty legacies. Unfortunately though, we do not live to see the day that our dynasty ascends the empire and it is up to Cesare to continue his father's legacy. As the new Duke of Tuscany, as well as King of Burgundy by marriage, we are faced with a liberty war. And because of our father's shrewd diplomacy, we have many powerful dynasty members that we can call in as allies. And finding it difficult to maintain the love of all of our vassals, we ensure to take the decisions and events that inspire fear and dread. We murder the young king of Bavaria to get one of our dynasty onto the throne as a new powerful ally. Our reign does not last long and Cesare II takes up the mantle, his wife having a claim to the Byzantine Empire that we prepared earlier. And thanks to his grandfather Niccolo, he is also heir to the Kingdom of Burgundy. Taking many prisoners in a recent liberty war against us, we take another page out of the prince, which states that men ought to be treated generously or crushed, lest they enact an almighty vengeance upon us. In this case, we torture the prisoners and execute each one of them, creating a forest of corpses. With our own subjects now living in fear, we look to finally make use of our wife's claim on the Byzantine Empire which after enacting various destabilizing murder schemes has left a child on the throne. Building up our private and powerful armies and then declaring war and calling in our very powerful allies, including the Kingdom of Bavaria and West Francia, this child is no match and we're able to win a quick and decisive war, sieging down multiple enemy provinces while keeping our local populace happy with minimal offensive war penalty. It is not long before our wife ascends to be empress, meaning that our progeny stand to inherit the throne, meaning that our dynasty may stand to unite the provinces of both the old Eastern and Western Roman empires, which Machiavelli generally held in very high regard. Shortly after winning the war, we continue down the Gale Tree, getting more bonuses for inspiring fear, and then we assist our wife to ensure she doesn't lose her newly acquired title, on our deathbed, our son takes up the position of Emperor. Taking a quick look at the dynasty map mode, we can see that in a mere century our dynasty has risen from lowly dukes to mighty kings and emperors, inspiring fear into the hearts of the great families of Europe. If you like this video and the twist to the CK3 playthrough, then be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more fun playthroughs of CK3 and many other games. Thanks very much guys and see you in the next one.